Homily, 5th Sunday of Easter, A Cycle, 2020. Our three readings today give us three interesting perspectives of the Church. Our second reading from St. Peter's first letter give us the ideal, the goal to shoot for. Beloved, come to him, a living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. That's the goal. Come to Jesus Christ and allow the Savior to incorporate you into his kingdom. Allow Christ to transform you into a person of holiness so you can be a working, functioning part of his kingdom. During this pandemic, many people have been out of work and it's been a concern for everyone. The unemployment rate a few months ago went from being the lowest it's been in decades to the highest. That's alarming. And the president and the governor have been, work, have been very vocal in their desire to get people back to work. Why are people so eager to work? Well, work provides us with the money we need to sustain ourselves and our families, but work also gives us a sense of purpose. Work gives us a feeling of accomplishment. When we've done a good day's work, we go home feeling satisfied with ourselves, that we've somehow, in some small way, made the world a better place. That is the real value of work. But before anyone can work, no matter what the job, how big or how small, everyone must undergo some kind of training for that job. That's what Peter is telling us here. God has a job for each of us to do. We all have a function in God's kingdom. But in order to do that job, we must be trained first by Christ himself. We must all go to Christ and allow him to shape us into that stone that fits into his plan. And that training, that shaping, is holiness. We cannot be a useful tool in the hand of God, we cannot be fitted into God's kingdom without holiness. And that training, that shaping, that holiness comes to us in three ways. Praying and meditating on the scriptures, acts of fasting and charity, and sacramental grace. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, thanks a lot, Father. That's a cheap shot. We can't receive the sacraments right now. It's true. We're all temporarily cut off from the sacraments. But by participating in Mass on TV or the Internet and making a spiritual communion, you are still receiving grace. Because your being cut off from the sacraments is not your fault. And we must always remember that while God works through the sacraments, God is not restricted to the sacraments. God has the ability to work above and beyond the sacraments. So even though you are distanced from the Eucharist, you are not cut off from grace. So Peter in the first reading, in the, in the second reading, excuse me, gives us the ideal of the church. We use these tools Christ has given us to grow in holiness so we can work and be productive members of his kingdom. Our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles gives us the reality of the church. What's happened? Gentile converts to the faith are complaining because their widows are being neglected when it comes to the distribution of food by the Christian community. The Jewish widows are being given an unfair advantage over the Gentile widows at mealtime, and a dispute starts. Can't you just see it? The name-calling, the finger-pointing, the accusations of conspiracy. Nothing changes in the church. We started having problems right on day one, and in 2,000 years, it hasn't stopped. The church is perfectly divine, and the church is perfectly human. And in her perfect humanity, the church is perfectly imperfect. Peter gives us the ideal in, the, in, that, in his first letter that I quoted— and we all want to seek holiness. The problem is our humanity keeps getting in the way of that. Sin keeps dragging us into the muck, and so conflicts continually arise. This is as current as our present situation in the church. The state is slowly starting to reopen, and because churches were not at the top of the list, people are accusing the governor of infringing on religious liberties. 
One of the lead stories in the Rhode Island Catholic this week addressed this very topic and said quite clearly that restrictions due to an emergency situation does not constitute a violation of religious liberties. For example, what if somebody living in southern England during the Battle of Britain said, well, I just can't sleep if I don't read at night, so I'm going to keep my lights on. We'd call that behavior selfish, and rightly so, because such an individual isn't just endangering his own life, but everyone's life around him. The governor was asked at a press conference a couple weeks ago, when would churches open again? And she responded that no church has submitted a plan to reopen. Now, the bishop's office can give us general parameters we have to follow, but it's impossible for the bishop to submit one blanket plan for the diocese because every church is a different size, a different layout, and has a different seating capacity. We all have to submit individual plans for our parishes. To that point, I had an online Zoom meeting with a joint subcommittee made up of members of the Parish and Finance Council this past week, and we came up with a rough draft of such a plan, which I hope to finalize this week and send off to the Bishop's Office for approval. Once we have that approval, we'll forward the plan to the Governor's Office for approval. We've handled this problem much in the same way the early church did in our first reading. A problem arose, the apostles met. They prayed, they devised, and implemented a solution. That's the way the church has always dealt with problems throughout history, because problems will inevitably arise. So how should the laity respond to all of this? Our gospel today. Jesus in our gospel gives us the perspective of the consolation of the church. Do not Let your hearts be troubled. Have faith in God and faith in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. The implication here is that we can control this. We can control our reaction to situations. So it's up to each one of us to resist the temptation, to give in to the knee-jerk reaction, and always assume the worst in people. And I'm preaching to myself here too, brothers and sisters, because I'm always ready to believe the conspiracy theories. We have to resist that. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith in God and faith in Jesus Christ. Why is this so important? Because so much of sin is rooted in fear and anxiety. When we give in to suspicions, we're giving the devil dominion over us. Trust comes from faith in God. It doesn't mean we have to be gullible. It doesn't mean we have to blindly accept what others tell us. This means whatever is happening, we trust that God is going to work everything out in the end. Everyone is doing the best they can. And as I mentioned last week, everyone is flying blind during this pandemic. Eventually, we will get our lives back. For now, we have to err on the side of caution and do what's in the best interest of everyone. My brothers and sisters, I pray we all have a peaceful week. Until next time, may God bless you and protect you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.